Hey, keto freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created Music to Code By. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. I'm Carl Franklin in Connecticut in the United States. And just a couple months ago, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In that time, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014, so that's two years. And when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. And within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. And we're going to share the progress of my journey through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for two years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail. Nah. Uh, we, <laughs> nah, we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science yeah. behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. We love to cook. We love to eat. So we're going to share some of the great food that we can eat on this diet. And every episode, we both share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. So... Let's start podcast number 10. Yeah. Alcohol. <laughs> Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Yeah, I referred to the units for fasting insulin being pico IU, but the correct unit is actually micro units per milliliter, micro IU. Um, I also mentioned that the Norwegian Hunt 2 study followed 5,000 individuals for 10 years, but it was actually 50,000 individuals for 10 years. Also, when we first published the cholesterol show on April 11th, it was linked to episode 8. Ah, uh, the diabetes one. Yeah. After about eight hours, coincidentally about the number of hours I slept that night, <laughs> we fixed it. <laughs> so what that means is if you got two keto dudes with a podcast uh, RSS aggregator, or podcast app, or iTunes like that, when it hit your inbox... You got a second copy of the Diabetes Show. Exactly. So you have to either go back to the website, uh, or somehow tell your RSS... Uh, Just delete it in your podcatcher. Yeah, I guess if you delete it in your podcatcher, you're fine. It'll come back. So let's reprise. What is a ketogenic diet? We like to do this sure. in every show. We restrict carbs to incidental carbs. Basically, no starchy carbs. The only carbs that we eat are from green leafy vegetables and occasional nuts. And no sugars either. No sugars. So no fruit. Yep. 
No, well, you say, you know, a berry once in a while, a strawberry, a couple of blueberries. Well, low sugar fruit like avocados are fine. Yeah, that's right. Avocados are actually a fruit and they are. tomatoes are too. And here's the thing. Raw tomatoes, good. Cooked tomatoes, mm, nah, not so not good. Not so much. <laughs> also, we eat just enough protein to maintain our muscles. And, uh, you know, I'm going to publish a link to that keto calculator right on the front page. So yeah. anybody can just go to our site and, and see the keto calculator. Uh, everything else that we get is fat, and it's either from fat that we're eating now or from fat that uh, we stored when we eat that Krispy Kreme 10 years That's ago. That's my favorite saying, that old Krispy <laughs> Kreme I ate a decade ago. I'm, I'm still eating it. <laughs> so, Richard, how'd you do this week? Uh, I've had a up and down week. I just went to a wedding this morning. It's actually uh, 10 p.m. Australian time right now. Um, yep. And I went to a wedding at 11 a.m. and uh, it was a very boozy affair, uh, which is apropos for this. Uh, in fact, I'm going to have some hair of the dog. It's going to be my recipe for the day and I'm going to make it right up the beginning of the show. So, Well, um, it's eight in the morning yeah. here, so I won't be having any hair of anything. <laughs> nah, that's, I got coffee, my friend. That's perfectly okay. <laughs> so um, I had, uh, let's see, I had maybe three bottles of Moe and... Uh, uh, a glass of white wine and three glasses of red wine. And by the end of that, um, I was f- feeling rather blitzed. But, um, feeling no pain. Yeah, feeling no pain. And un- unfortunately, the problem, one of the real problems with alcohol, which we'll talk about during the show, is you tend to make bad decisions. And bad when the dessert, adult. I know. When the dessert tray came out, it was a pavlova, which is an Australian dessert, which is made from whipped cream, which is good, and berries, which are okay, and sugar and egg white made into a meringue. Right, so sugar. And so I had two spoonfuls of that. And so I had a lot of sugar for me. Um, I probably would have had maybe maybe a tablespoon of sugar all up, which when you think about it, it's not that much. We were talking about this. You mentioned that your blood sugar didn't spike all that much. No, it was really quite strange. When I came home, I tested my, my blood sugar. Now, normally, uh, my blood sugar should be about 5.2. And that's about, uh, I think it's about 100 on the US uh, system. And I tested my blood and it was 4.4, which is about 79 in milligrams wow. per deciliter. So it had actually dropped. And I, I, I tested it again about an hour later. It had gone from 4.4 up to 4.7. And then I tested it five minutes ago, which is uh, uh, probably two hours after that. And it was back to five, my normal uh, range. So do you chalk that up to being fat adapted? I think I chalk that up to being a hyper producer of insulin and I still have that yeah. as part of my characteristic. And so what happened was my body's not wasn't used to uh, responding to uh, a glucose, a large amount of glucose. And basically it said, oh, right, we need to get the insulin going and it produced too much and it took me too low. Wow. But that was a good thing. I had a little nap and now I'm fine. That's funny. <laughs> and t- tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to go for a 64K bike ride. So that's my penance. Uh- <laughs> yeah, some penance. You yeah. love it. Yeah. <laughs> I do love it actually. So how was your week, Carl? I had such a good week. So really? as you remember from the cholesterol show, I had yeah. just got my numbers, but my doctor and I hadn't met yet. Right. All right. I'm gonna tell you the story from the beginning. On September third, twenty fifteen, I had blood work done. And this was my starting blood work, right? Right. My weight was 366, which isn't the highest I've ever been. Uh, I did this diet. I didn't know it was the ketogenic diet, but I essentially did this diet back in 2007 and 2008. And I was 378 at that time. Wow. All right. So anyway, I was 366. But you weren't diabetic back then, were you? You mean back in 2007, 2008? Yeah. Yeah, no, I wasn't diabetic. So, uh, September, blood pressure was 140 over 72, mm. pulse 94, BMI 53.7. That, you know, doesn't really matter. My glucose was 161. My total cholesterol was 199. My HDL was 42. My triglycerides were 335. Not good. Uh, LDL was 90. My A1C, which is the three month average of blood sugar, yeah. was 7.4. And that wow. was in the yeah. diabetic range. So my doctor said, uh, you have diabetes. Fast forward to April 8th. Uh, my weight was 331, which, by the way, right now it is 321. Right. So wow. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm down 45 pounds. Wow. That's incredible. Yep. April 8th, my glucose was 136. And just yesterday, it was 119. 
Wow. My total cholesterol was 283. So that went up from 199 to 283. And I, we knew this was going to be a, a, you know, a, a lecture point for my doctor. And sure. when you hear the story, you'll find out what happened. Mm. So that's why we did the cholesterol show. Yeah. Uh, my triglycerides, although they were still high, 234, they were down from 335. So they actually dropped 100 points. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, my HDL dropped by five points. It was 37 April 8th. And I'm not sure why that happened. I'm not sure why that happened either. I mean, no. typically what we know about ketogenic diets is HDL goes up. That's right. Uh, in this case, LDL went up to 199. Mm -hmm. um, but my A1C, 6.1. Awesome. Yeah. So out of the diabetic range. Out of the diabetic range. I had reverse diabetes. And that's why we've changed the, the, the beginning of the show. You no longer yeah. reversing your diabetes. You have reversed your diabetes. I have reversed it. <laughs> right. So here's what happened yesterday when I went to my doctor's office. First of all, she came in and just was, uh, the mouth hit the floor. She said, you are my poster child for how to deal with diabetes. And I wow. said, yeah. And I stopped taking your medications. And she said, <laughs> I know. She was completely floored. Yeah. And then she said, your sugars are awesome, but your cholesterol is uh, doggy do terrible. Oh, no. And it's, it's through the roof. Now, here's the fun part, Richard. Yeah. We spent a week doing research on cholesterol. We did. Well, we do a lot of research for every show that we do. That's right. And last week's show was cholesterol, yeah. Right, because we decided my cholesterol was high. I really mm -hmm. want to find out what's going on and have an intelligent conversation with my doctor. Yeah. So I printed out a pile of studies that we had linked to and found, and also links to uh, lectures. All of these studies showed that low levels of LDL cholesterol increase the risk of heart disease, mm -hmm. and that higher levels of LDL cholesterol actually protected against heart disease. And definitely over 50, yeah. Yeah, which is completely opposite yeah. of conventional wisdom. Pretty much. So as soon as she was done lecturing me, I said, okay, here's the thing. Can you show me the science, show me the studies that establish causation between high LDL and heart disease, right? increased risk of heart disease or heart attacks. And she said, no, I can't. Wow. Okay. Right away. Yeah. No hesitation. She said, no, I can't. Hmm. She said, I'll tell you what, in my nine years of practice, I have seen people who look completely normal and their sugars are fine right? and their cholesterol is manageable. And all of a sudden they have a stroke out of nowhere. And when we look at these people, their carotid arteries are plaqued. Right. And I said, I have science here that, that shows not only uh, correlations between high cholesterol and reduced risk of heart disease, but also non-correlation of low LDL cholesterol right. and heart disease. In other words, I have studies here where people have heart disease, but low LDL cholesterol. So that's what you call a black swan. Yeah. Non-correlation is non-causation. That's right. But correlation is not causation. Cannot imply causation. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, and then I gave her the whole firefighters showing up at the fire. <laughs> it, it, so it's entirely possible that something else is causing uh, the placking. Yeah. And cholesterol just happens to be at the scene of the crime. Right. Maybe it's trying to fix the problem. We don't know and gets stuck. And then we talked about low density lipoproteins. And so anyway, she said, how can I lecture someone who comes with science? This is awesome. <laughs> Look, I, I've got to say, if your doctor is watching, I do apologize for helping you ambush her with all that science. Well, <laughs> you know, I, it wasn't really an ambush because I said, just read this. And yeah. we'll, if you can find stuff that... Talk me out of it. Yeah. If you can talk me out of it, you can yeah. find something that supports... Your decision, mm. uh, I'll go on statins and stuff, but give me six months. Awesome. That's what I said. Give me six months. So she agreed. And I said, now, instead of focusing on cholesterol, which seems to be up in the air in terms of whether it's a real problem or not, let's focus on heart disease. Let's do some tests to see if my arteries are plaqued. Right. She says, she scratches her head and said, hmm, well, I don't know. I, we could do an invasive you know, uh, test, but we'd have to go into your arteries and scrape them and stuff. And, and, Ugh. and I said, but there are also non-invasive tests. Yeah. She said, I'll tell you what, we could do an ultrasound on your carotid arteries. Right. I think they call that an intimal thickness. It's like testing the thickness of the artery wall. 
So basically, we're going to do that. Awesome. And I said, of course. you know. And then she says, I'll refer you to cardiology, and you can further this discussion with them. Awesome. But what's interesting is that here's my doctor telling, wagging her finger at me about cholesterol, but has absolutely no science to back it up. Right. So like most doctors, she was probably told in a, by a professor in a class somewhere that there's a correlation or a causation between heart disease, but no science was ever given. And as, as we spoke about it last week, there is cholesterol in arterial plaques that cause heart disease. So it's obvious, you know, right. if you if you were a pathologist, you're doing an, a, an autopsy and you see yep. this cholesterol there, you're going to say, ah, there must be a link between cholesterol right. and heart disease. And, and there surely is a link, but we don't know if it comes after or before. We don't know if it's right. a cause or association. When you have high triglycerides, uh, your LDL lasts for longer. It hangs around for longer and has yeah. more opportunity to get oxidized and um, and glycated if you have a lot of sugar. It could be that it's not so much the fire trucks turning up with this cholesterol, uh, these firemen to help put out the fire, it yeah. could be that every now and then one of these fire tracks has an arsonist on it, <laughs> and that might be the trick. Maybe, maybe right. it might be these small, dense, oxidized LDL that init- they they additionally cause inflammation, um, much as like insulin also causes inflammation. Viruses cause inflammation in the arteries. There are a lot of things that will cause the initial problem. Um, right. But maybe that may be where the link to LDL and uh, particularly small, dense LDL comes from. Maybe. And we're just speculating here. We so are. Yeah. The other thing I learned is that cholesterol is one substance, but the lipoproteins that carry the cholesterol, these are the things that have the different shape and size. Right. Cholesterol is like a waxy substance. Think of it like little balls of earwax. <laughs> it is It is one thing. Cholesterol is one thing. Yeah. But, but the proteins that we talk about are what they stick to. Okay, so they're the they're the things that carry the cholesterol around through the body. Sure, yeah. and it's the yeah. So it's the small lipoproteins that are really dense that tend to have uh, detrimental effects. And I'm not sure exactly how the science works, but that's what that's what I've heard. Hmm. So uh, in other words, it was good. She's very. She, I'm a rock star, apparently. Yeah, of course you are. <laughs> but there's more work to do, and I'm very happy that she's on my side yeah. and willing to look at the science. Oh, well, that's excellent. All right, Richard, it's time for mail. Mail. We're just and we don't need no mail. 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 <laughs> Let's bring us some mail. <laughs> This was a comment that was left on Two Keto Dudes by Barton Dorman. He says, hello, Carl and Richard. I've been listening to your podcast and I've been enjoying it. Oh, thank you, Barton. Yeah, thank you very much. I have been doing the keto thing since November of 2015. I suffer from hypertriglyceridemia, which means elevated levels of triglycerides. Sure. And when my triglycerides came back at 1180, I knew I had to do something. When I was at my worst, mine were 1111. Whoa. And I thought those were the highest. They're the highest of anyone I've ever heard of, but uh, 1180, yikes. He says, unfortunately, I was put on a statin drug, and my doctor told me, and he says unfortunately because, as we mentioned before, there are some studies that show detrimental effects of statins. There are. And there haven't really been any studies that show positive effects of statins that haven't been funded by statin companies. We know that statins reduce LDL. Whether that means anything or not is another question. Right. So he says, unfortunately, I was put on a statin drug and my doctor told me that even on the drug, my triglycerides would never be normal. Oh. I can thank my ancestors for the bad DNA. After 30 days of keto, 30 days, Richard, Wow! and unfortunately using the statin, I dropped my triglycerides to 158, over a thousand points. If he gets it under a hundred, then his LDL is perfectly uh, light and fluffy, benign LDL. Right. My doctor was astonished. I had also dropped nearly 30 pounds in weight during the first month. Wow. Pound a day. Wow. I just went in for another blood test a week ago after 90 days since the last and have dropped another 30 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope my lipids will get to a level that will allow me to get off the statin. That's awesome. Isn't that amazing? That's outstanding. So that, uh, I guess the first 30 days, um, some of that might have been adaptation. Or maybe this was once he was adapted, once he was fat adapted, and then the yeah, 30 maybe. days. But that's, that's outstanding results. So well done. Yep. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Barton, for that. And if you want to communicate with us, you can leave a comment on 2KetoDudes.com. You can also send us email, dudes at 2KetoDudes.com. And you can send me a tweet. I'm at Carl Franklin. And I'm at Chiron, K-H-I-R-O-N. All right, let's talk about alcohol. Yes. Well, first of all, I'm going to do my recipe because I, I've, I've, I, I'm just a little bit hungover. I've had a nap. I've had a big day. And now I have in front of me some rum and some mixing. So I'm going to do my recipe now, if you don't mind, because I'm going to drink it. Why don't you just go ahead and have a drink, Richard? I'm going to go ahead and have a drink. And I'm going to, I'm, I, have, uh, I have here with me, I'm making a mojito. I'm making a low-carb mojito. Richard, the listeners out there might be thinking, rum? That's full of sugar. Yeah, it's made from sugar. <laughs> yeah. it's, How can you drink that? It's actually distilled. There's very little sugar in it at all. In fact, there's none. There's none. That's right. They use uh, they they get yeast to turn the sugar into ethanol, and then they distill it so that you just have ethanol uh, remaining, and then they put them in bourbon bourbon cask. It's put into a bourbon cask. That's right to uh, to acquire that flavour and. Uh, and color, so it's a dark rum. All right. Um, so I'm nice. going to take some of my rum, and I've got uh, I have here uh, a lime, which I half of half of a lime, which I've squeezed into a glass, and I've got some uh, ice cubes, and All right. I have some mint as well. Did you put any sweetener in that? I did. I put two tabs of Splendor in. I, I have tried a few a few techniques. I tried to make up a syrup out of um, <laughs> I tried to make up a syrup out of erythritol, and it turned out to – it didn't work as well as I expected. It turned out to be – it looked like an ice skating lake, a disc, a large disc of stuff. Oh, no. It just didn't work. So yeah, I didn't like the way erythritol melted for me. In fact, I like xylitol, as, as everybody knows. And yeah. I put a little xylitol with some water in a coffee cup and nuke it for about a minute, and that dissolves nicely. Nice. So. So, so now I've, I'm, I'm going to muddle my, my drink, which is just I, – I use an old wooden – Muddler, it's just like a stick, and um, and now I'm going to add to it some soda, and I have a soda stream, which is an awesome machine. Now, soda by soda, you mean just carbonated water? This is just carb, yeah, carbonated water. In Australia, we call this soda. I know we call we call soda soft drink, so we just have to have a little bit of a. Okay, let's. Oh, oh. doesn't that look good? <laughs> so there's my mojito. It's got mint in it. It's got uh, mint leaves. It's got uh, lime. It's got splendor. And I'm going to get started on this. So you, you you talk while I have a few drinks. All right, you go ahead and do that. I raise my coffee cup to you, sir, because again, Ching-ching. it's eight in the morning here. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> oh, I love technology. All right, so a disclaimer. First of all, I couldn't find any real studies on alcohol in ketogenic diets. Uh, maybe there are some out there, but I haven't found any. It's all conventional wisdom, as far as we can tell, because there's no. There's no studies, there's no proof, but everybody seems to be in agreement. First of all, no carbs in straight alcohol. Yeah, anything that's distilled, unless they've added the sugars in afterwards. That's exactly right. So even rums, you got to watch out for the flavored rums. Like, you know, I I believe Bacardi's going to be fine, but I believe like a Captain Morgan spiced rum. Yeah, or Malibu, this coconut rum, yeah. Goslings, maybe even. I'm not sure about Goslings. But uh, bourbon, no yeah. problem, zero. Uh, Canadian whiskey, Jack Daniels, gin, vodka, vodka, tequila, tequila, all of the usual suspects, zero carbs. Nice. All right. Now, does that mean if you're on a keto diet, you can just drink and drink and drink? Well, it turns out there was a diet in the '60s, 1964. This guy who had a nom de plume of Robert Cameron okay. had this little pamphlet called The Drinking Man's Diet. And we're going to link to a story at Forbes about this from 2004 because it's essentially a low-carb, high-fat diet with alcohol. Nice. <laughs> it was very, very popular. I'll bet it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen to this article. Um, by the way, this is just great writing. And this is one of the things I love about, you know, real uh, uh, real journalism. Journalism, yeah. Did you ever hear of a diet which was fun to follow? A diet which would let you have two martinis before lunch and a thick steak <laughs> generously <laughs> spread with sauce bernaise oh. so that you could make your sale in a relaxed atmosphere and go back to the office without worrying about having gained so much as an ounce? 
a diet which allows you to take out your favorite girl for dinner of squab and broccoli with hollandaise sauce and Chateau Lafitte mm. to be followed by an evening of rapture and champagne. <laughs> so starts a jaunty little pamphlet. And, and that was a quote, obviously. So starts a jaunty little pamphlet called The Drinking Man's Diet. I can't imagine why that was popular. <laughs> yeah, in 1964. It's like, if you've seen Mad Men, you know exactly what this is all about. It was published by an equally jaunty San Francisco bon vivant, Robert Cameron, who priced it at $1. Cameron used noms de plume, first Gardner Jameson and Elliot Williams, later Jeffrey W. Roberts. In two years, he had sold 2.4 million copies Yikes. in 13 languages. Now, Cameron, 93, as of 2004, mm -hmm. still jaunty. Still a bon vivant and still admirably trim from following his own diet is reissuing this classic, and it can be bought for four ninety five through Amazon dot com or through Cameron's own website, AboveBooks.com. Isn't that awesome? That's uh, so. I wonder what happened to it because that must have. What was it? Two point four million people bought it. Yeah, and 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 the, we've pretty much not heard of the diet. Well, when I was a kid, my father used to have comic books by uh, Johnny Hart, BC. You remember BC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, BC was full of great puns and great jokes and one-liners and stuff. And one of them was, you know, Peter and BC are walking. He says, I've started the drinking man's diet. Oh, really? What's that? He says, you can drink all you want. And he says, what do you eat? Aspirin. <laughs> 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 and so I thought to myself, drinking man's diet, I, that must be something that Johnny Hart just made up. Yeah. And all these years later, you know, almost 40 years later, turns out that it's a real thing. All right. Now, the other thing you need to know is that when you're on a ketogenic diet, the effects of alcohol are amplified, especially if you do not have a lot of body fat. Right. For guys like Richard and me, we can probably handle it, but the web is full of anecdotes of people who, after doing a low-carb, high-fat diet, have one beer or one glass of wine and they're completely blitzed, like cannot function. So, kids, be careful. Yeah. And you should always be careful and not drink too much anyway. Yeah. I've got to admit, I I get more drunk since going on keto than I did before keto. Uh, I had a feeling. And probably like, more from the weight loss, don't you think? It could have been, yeah. It could have been, uh, could have been now that I've lost more weight. I know that one thing that people say is that after two years of keto, that tolerance issue goes away. So it might just be that that's, that's part of the early process in keto. Maybe. So what happens when you drink alcohol is that it has to be metabolized by your liver. Because it's poison. Well, it is poison and there's no – well, it's certainly a toxin and there's no, there's no place to store alcohol while it's waiting to get to it. So I, I think of it as somebody coming into the emergency room with a broken arm. Yes, that's right. Everybody focuses on that person because it's an emergency. And when you drink alcohol, you're introducing a poison into your body. The liver says, oh, I've been happily burning fat over here, but I, I got to stop what I'm doing and take care of this alcohol. It's, that's right. It's triage. Now, now you don't – Totally stop everything else, but you but everything else slows down while you while your liver focuses on alcohol, right. because as long as you've got alcohol in your blood, it's doing doing damage to you. So right. your liver has to that that's its priority number one is to get this alcohol down, and we do that by metabolizing it, and it's going to steal some of the uh, some of the resources from other processes in the liver, and one of those mm. processes is gluconeogenesis that's making your your glucose if you're in keto. That's what's making your glucose, it's keeping your brain going. Right. And making gluconeogenesis makes ketones because, as we mentioned before, the process of making glu gluconeogenesis steals some of the, uh, the metabolites that are part of the process of burning fat, causing uh, cells in your liver to spill ketones. Well, you stop gluconeogenesis or you slow it down by drinking some alcohol, you slow down the production of ketones. And so... What What's happen? interesting about this, Richard, is that if you are a gluco burner, yeah. and this may explain the whole sensitivity thing, if you're a gluco burner, you got glycogen. You have a resource of glucose. You don't need gluconeogenesis. Right. Yeah. And when you're not, you're probably producing just enough glucose to keep your brain happy and to keep uh, you know whatever other cells use it. So when you interrupt it with alcohol, the effects may be greater because of that. That's actually interesting that a lot of cases, alcohol comes with carbs. Right. So you have a mixer with your alcohol. So um, in a lot of cases, so maybe there's a reason for that. 
is that uh, people had less hangovers or felt less awful when they had um, uh, you know, a mixer with their, with their neat alcohol. Which is completely opposite from my experience. My experience has been if I have sugar in my drinks, yeah. I have a headache the next day, I have a hangover. Wow. But if I'm drinking just straight bourbon, which I tend to do, yeah. I tend to get a, a, a single or if I'm feeling happy, a double <laughs> uh, bourbon on the rocks. And I used to drink it neat because, you know, only wussies drink on the rocks, according to some people. <laughs> But I found that if I drink it on the rocks, I like the strength at first and the slow dilution. Right. And it also helps me pace myself more, which yeah. now more than ever, I'm really, really focused on pacing yeah. because I love my liver. My liver is saving my life right now. Yeah, and it is. I want to treat it nicely. Yeah, be look, look after that liver. <laughs> Thank you, liver. Thank you. I hated liver growing up. Yeah, I still hate it. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So it pauses ketosis, and this. That's right. And I don't know if you have a study that shows this metabolism, but no, uh, no. but everybody seems to be in agreement that it does pause ketosis. I don't agree with some doctors that say alcohol is the same as sugar. Uh, it clearly isn't, and it clearly doesn't metabolize like sugar. Mm. And and I also want to point out that a friend of mine who is a learned professor, a professor with tenure, uh, when he asked me what. How did you lose so much weight? And this was back in 2007, 2008, and I lost over 50 pounds. Yeah. I said, I've been following a special Carl Franklin diet called the meat and <laughs> bourbon diet. And he goes, oh, really? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I basically just eat a, a very low carb, high fat lunch. I don't eat breakfast. Right. And then at dinner time, I just drink. I don't mm. eat dinner and I go have a few drinks and I go home and I lose a lot of weight. And he goes, drink. I said, yeah, just bourbon. Turns <laughs> out there's no carbs in bourbon. He laughs at me and wags his finger because he has a disease called, I know more than you do because I'm a professor of disease. Okay. And he says, he says, Carl, bourbon has carbs. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, Bite me. Bite That's what me. I thought. I'm like, show me the science. Yeah. I can show you. Yeah. He thought it was calories, probably. Yeah. I'm going to get a t-shirt, Richard. Maybe we can sell them that says, <laughs> show me the science. Yeah. Because this is my standard response to anybody who wags their finger at me. And I have recently had several people wag their finger at me about cholesterol sure. and, uh, you know, before about bourbon. So. Show me the science, mofos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So alcohol does have some calories. So that might have been what right. your professor friend was mistaken about. Uh, yeah. It, it does have it, – it's it's another one of the, the macronutrients that provides us caloric energy uh, as right. uh, similar to fat and glucose and protein or am amino acids and ketones. Uh, right. Alcohol is like the fifth uh, macronutrient. And it yep. turns out that it, produ it, it will provide about seven kilocalories per gram of – alcohol so yeah if you only drink bourbon if that's if you drink bourbon and nothing else you will be having a few calories yeah and i noticed that uh in doing this diet the ketogenic diet i do still have a couple of drinks at night mm. sometimes red wine uh most of the time just a couple of bourbons on the rocks spread out over four hours or so or two hours sure and normally if i don't overeat and i don't over drink i will still lose weight in the morning yeah. Nice. Um, but I have noticed that, you know, if I have a day that starts with bulletproof coffee and I have a keto lunch and I have a keto dinner and then I drink, you know, I'm probably not going to lose any weight. Yeah. I might even gain a pound. I, I think I probably drink maybe once a week. Yeah. I remember going to, I went to a doctor once and, and a new doctor and the nurse was taking my vital statistics prior to going in to see the doctor and she asked me if I was a drinker and I said, oh, moderate drinker. And she says, what, you know? About uh, two or three drinks a night. I said, "Well, like two or three a month," and she just laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a time when I was a heavy drinker, but uh, I, you're I, a teetotaler. Um, well, I'm pretty damn close. I was. Uh, I. I. There was a time when I can remember going to St. Petersburg with three Russians, chaperoned by the wives oh, of one of these Russians. That's and, bad. And and <laughs> there were actually two other Russians and myself, and and a, a wife as a chaperone. And we went through four bottles of vodka in the two days yeah. that we were there. And that and was just lunch. 
Yeah, <laughs> pretty much lunch. <laughs> they know so, how to drink over there. The Poles yeah. and the Russians, they drink vodka like water. I think in that kind of environment, you have to be Russian not to wake up in a pool of your own vomit. So <laughs> Probably. Yeah, they've, they've nailed it. Yeah. Okay, now it's time to play a little game we call How Much Carbs Is In That Drink? Nice. All right, we've already talked about pure spirits being zero carbs. And my mojito here has zero carbs, so cheers. Right. <laughs> Except you might have a little from the mint or... Or yeah, something yeah. like that, but incidental <laughs> carbs. Right. But absolutely zero in pure spirits. Be careful of sugar. Be careful of added sugar. And if you're at all concerned about that, check the label. Also, um, you talked about rum. Rum is great because it has that sweet flavor. Mm. And bourbon does too, you know, especially the weeded bourbons like Maker's Mark, yeah. Blanton's. They have a, a sweeter flavor, yet there's no sugar. Mm. So, how about wine? Mm, white wine. So um, I white wines like a, a Sav Blanc, I think, have you know two or three grams of uh, carbohydrates yep. per glass. Three grams, three grams per glass. A Chardonnay would have uh, three point two per glass. So um, yep. you, you can have you can certainly have one with it, with dinner. I wouldn't have four because you're not going to have much no. room for having much more uh, carbohydrates in your day. Correct. And also, I would stay away from things like Riesling, which tend to have a lot more sugar in them. Right. And certainly, you wouldn't go for Moscato or any of the, any of the summer wines because they're going to yeah. have a lot more um, sugars, residual sugars. In them. Also, I would avoid port wines, sherries, you know, those kinds of oh, things. The fortified ones, definitely. You don't yeah. want any of those, yeah. All right. Let's talk about red wine. Mm, sure. I love red wine. Pinot Noir and Merlot, 3.7. Okay. Cabernet and Syrah, 3.8. Still not bad. Or as we call them in Australia, Shiraz. Ah, Shiraz, <laughs> The rest yeah. of the world calls it Shiraz. We call it Shiraz. <laughs> yeah. Well, in Australia, it's got some good Shiraz too, let me tell you. We certainly do. But even so, Shiraz probably still going to be in that four gram range per glass. So it's not bad. You can certainly have one with, with a meal. If you have a, a meal with, with almost no, no carbs, you can certainly have a, oh, sure. a glass of red wine and feel, you know, fit right within your macro. So that's fine. And of course, what goes better with a big fatty steak than a mm. glass of, or two of red wine? Lovely. All right. Now let's talk beer. Mm. 12 ounce servings. And this is according to a website, realbeer.com, which we'll link to. Sure. So again, we haven't seen scientific studies, but there doesn't seem to be any argument about these things. They're, uh, the carbs are published right on the bottles. Um, the lightest one I could find is IC light, letter I, letter C, light, 2.8. There's, there's one in Australia that's got zero carbs. It's called Big Head uh, Beer. Huh. And I think it's big head, and but I, I've I've tasted it and it was fairly ordinary, so <laughs> I wouldn't okay. drink it for the taste. All right, well here's just a few more. Amstel Light has five. Budweiser ten point six. Wow. Bud Light six point six. Interesting. Yeah, Blue Moon, which is a Belgian sort of white beer, mm -hmm. uh, wheat beer, twelve point nine, even more. And Guinness, everybody's Guinness. favorite. Yeah. What? How much has Guinness got? What do you think? Low or high? I'd say low. I would think low too, but it turns out 14 carbs. <sighs> Ouch. No, I can't drink any of that. 14 grams. The highest one I found on this list, Sierra Nevada Bigfoot. 30.3 grams per 12 ounces Yowzers. of beer. I've heard people say that beer is just liquid bread. So, uh, yeah, yeah, a bottle of bread. Yay heavy in a bottle of bread, said yeah. Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So uh, uh, yeah, so beers. I I would be very te I'd be tempted not to have beers or have very small amounts or you know. Me too. Um, if you're doing it, if you're having it for taste, you can certainly cook with them. Um, yep. You know, if you're in a, in a large meal, um, beer adds a lovely flavour to you know to a broth and what have you. Or cheese. Right. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, cheese. Nice. Mm, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I would certainly, I'd steer steer clear of beer if you have the option. It's it's much easier just to if you're if you're at a bar, a random bar, or a, a party or whatever, ask for rum and diet coke or something like that. That's uh, that's a generic drink that would people wouldn't look twice at. But of course, it's got no carbs. So, or you could just learn to love whiskey for its own flavor. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is when I was, true. Uh, I don't know, I was just turned 21 and, you know, my father uh, noticed that I was taking an interest in drinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I made myself a highball, which was okay. um, whiskey and seven up or whiskey and Sprite, you know, highball. Sure. Right. 
And my father told me, I'll never forget this. He says, why would you ruin a perfectly good whiskey with soda pop? <laughs> good point, Dad. Good point. And I thought, well, I thought, I thought, well, that's a very erudite thing to say yeah, to a twenty-one-year-old yeah. who just yeah. wants to get his drink on. But you know, okay, Dad, no problem. <laughs> Later, did I realize that you know the sugar was a problem? But right. uh, yeah. Okay, there's one more thing we need to talk about, and that's resveratrol. Okay. Do you know yeah. about resveratrol? No. Tell me about that. Resveratrol is a substance that's found in chocolate, some in coffee, in grapes, and in red wine. So it's delicious. It's delicious. Yes. But it has been thought to have antioxidant powers. Okay. And in, in, in some people even say it's the fountain of youth, right? It will re- <gasps> reduce your risk of heart disease and all of these things. Well, the studies, eh, from what I've seen, you have to take a lot of it to get the benefits. Right. And so there are these manufacturers, of course, that make pills with 2000 milligrams of resveratrol, you know, just like ultra loaded with resveratrol. Because if something's good, take more. Yeah, take right? more of it, obviously. And another study came out at Harvard that shows eh, it's not all that hype, you know, it's hyped a little bit. Yeah. And it also turns out that a glass of wine has about 100 milligrams of resveratrol, which hasn't been proven to do much of anything. So you'd have to get a lot of red wine into your system to get yeah. the health benefits of resveratrol. Um, they're thinking, though, is that over time, you know, maybe this is one of the secrets of the Mediterranean diet because they all drink red wine. Well, I, th- I think you, one you of know. the things is that uh, scientists have been trying to explain the French paradox because the French eat more saturated fat than anybody else and have fewer heart attacks than anybody else in Europe. And right. uh, the Swiss as well. Swiss eat cheese like it's going out of fashion and uh, and uh, and they have fewer heart attacks and so scientists have been trying to explain that by looking at other things in the diet that these people eat but it could actually just be the saturated fat is actually good for you yeah and and you know the wine isn't isn't hurting um it could also be that the french take three hours for lunch <laughs> they their stress levels are very low yeah you know, they work on relaxing and enjoying life. Yeah. They work on a conversation over lunch as well. Yeah. I think one thing about, uh, I'd say about antioxidants, about resveratrol and other things like that, is that um, on a ketogenic diet, because we because we have a high level of ketones in our, in our blood, uh, we are using those quite a lot throughout our body. Obviously, the brain requires them, but the rest of the body will also burn them. And mm. it turns out that burning ketones is a... Is a is a process in the in the mitochondria that produces the least amount of uh, of reactive oxygen species. So, uh, oh. in terms of uh, of, of um, antioxidants, you don't need as many antioxidants when you're running on on uh, on ketones because, unlike glucose uh, or even uh, burning fat, you produce a lot less reactive oxygen species. So, which means you're going to have less inflammation. That's right. Yes, from the, from in every cell in your body, you you should have less inflammation. Inflammation, and that uh, that then uh, uh, that probably explains why you see that in the blood work of uh, you know looking at markers of inflammation will seem to go down as well when you go on a keto diet too. Yeah. And this is one of the things I brought up to my doctor is that inflammation is always present in um, sclerosis. Yeah. When small, dense LDL, which you can sort of track with triglycerides. If triglycerides are low, you can pretty much guess that small, dense LDL is low. Um, Those get lodged in and stuck in artery walls for some reason. They get inflamed. The microphages come along and feast on it. And uh, so inflammation is not your friend and low triglycerides are your friend. And uh, on a ketogenic diet, uh, inflammation goes down and so does triglycerides. So that was another one of my arguments to her. Yeah. One of the things that does cause inflammation is insulin. And you know that if your, if your blood glucose levels are going down, that your insulin should be going down as well. So that your, your generic, your, your systemic uh, inflammation is, is dropping. And I think that's actually showing it in the results. Yeah. And by the way, my insulin was 14.8. Right. And I don't have a, um, a control marker for that. A, base, a baseline, yeah. But, you know, where is that in, on the scale of low to high? And that was fasting, was it? Yeah, fasting insulin. Yeah, yeah see, most, most people should have uh, a fasting insulin. If you're fairly healthy, you're not insulin resistant, you probably have it in the range of 5 to 10. Okay. But if you are extremely insulin resistant... 
Um, I think they call it a pattern four, craft pattern four. Okay. Uh, if you have craft pattern four, uh, your your insulin never goes below about 50. Wow. It's high for a normal person, but it's low for a, a diabetic person. So I think that you, I'm going to get my, my blood blood tests done next week and mm. uh, I'm going to see what my, in, my fast, I've never had a fasting insulin. So that yeah. would be interesting. So I'm also looking forward to uh, my follow-up doctor visit in three months. And of course, I'll get blood work done before that too. And I'm really, really interested to see what happens because one of two things can happen. Either I'm in for a really rude awakening and my doctor's going to put me on some kind of statin. Yeah. Or the doc is going to be uh, preaching the gospel of the ketogenic diet to all her diabetic <laughs> patients. Which, which would be a great thing. Either case would be good. I mean, if I learned something, that's great. And if she learned something, that's also great. Probably we're both going to learn a lot, but I yeah. don't mind being your guinea pig. <laughs> no, no, that's good. Uh, so far, so good. I think that's the important thing. So far, so good. And the weight loss is a bonus. To, a, a bonus. This is <laughs> great. I've never felt better in my life. 45 pounds. Yeah. It's unbelievable. That's outstanding. Well done. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, not time for a victory lap yet, but nah. well done. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> All right, it's time for recipes. Can you say you're due for a little... Recipes. I've already recipes. started my. I've started my recipe. It's in the glass. <laughs> so That's I, okay. I, yeah. So it's my. It's really just Carl's recipe. Carl's, Carl's recipes. Recipe. Carl's recipes. Carl's recipe. Carl's recipe. <laughs> okay, Carl. What have you got for us today? I have a cocktail for you. Uh, we all know what Manhattans are. Mm-hmm. A Manhattan is bourbon and sweet vermouth, sometimes dry vermouth, and a shot of bitters. Nice. Now, I went to the Maker's Mark Distillery on a tour in 2014. And I was taken around by a friend of mine's uncle, whose job at Maker's Mark is to test the bourbon. Ooh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> His job is to say, that bourbon is Maker's Mark. We can call that Maker's Mark. That one, eh, not so good. We'll sell that one to some other- we'll sell that to the secondary market. Secondary yeah. market, right. And uh, he gave me a recipe for the perfect Manhattan. Okay. And the perfect Manhattan is, and I don't have the ratios here and I'm very sorry, but you can look it up. The perfect Manhattan is Maker's Mark 46, and that is separate from regular Maker's Mark or cask strength Maker's Mark. This is, take, they take Maker's Mark and they age it a little bit longer in barrels, just a few months, with toasted French oak staves in the mm, barrel. Right. They're toasted. They're not charred like the inside of a white oak barrel with regular sure. bourbon. They're just caramelized a little bit. Nice. And they call it 46 because they tested a whole bunch of different recipes and flavor profiles, they call them. And this was flavor profile number 46. Nice. Yeah. So the perfect Manhattan, take a little Maker's 46, however many ounces, five ounces, I think, is a regular one. Mm -hmm. Take an ounce of uh, dry vermouth, an ounce of sweet vermouth, and bitters. So is that Swedish bitters? Like an Angostura? Any bitters. Or, bitters yeah. are, are a whole thing in and of themselves. Bitters are just a, uh, yeah. you know, a, an add-in. Very potent flavor. Not a whole lot of alcohol. I don't even think there is alcohol in bitters, but mm. but it really adds a kick to to a Manhattan. Now, what I would suggest, because mm -hmm. sweet vermouth has sugar in it, and you're going to get maybe five to six grams of carbs per ounce of sweet vermouth, I would just not yeah. use that. Use dry vermouth. Dry vermouth has the flavor of vermouth, none of the sugar. Less of the sugar, yeah. Only 0. 0.2 grams of carbs. Stir that up over ice. Nice. And that is wonderful. And, you know, that's a nice flavor. But if you appreciate the flavor of a good bourbon, <laughs> just pour it over ice. So have you ever, have you ever, tried, have you ever tried whiskey rocks, which are like uh, rocks that you put in the, in the freezer? Yes. But they're not going to dilute over time, are they? That's right. If you like your whiskey neat and uh, there's a mm. benefit to having it cold, which is it, it gets okay. a little more viscous nice. and it's smooth and wonderful. <sighs> You can either put your whiskey in the freezer, which I do, or if you like it neat, you can use these whiskey rocks. As Richard said, they're stones. I've seen them in, I've seen them in stores. I've been meaning to, to try them out. You put the rocks in the freezer, and then they chill your drink, but they don't dilute because they're stones. 
Another thing that we do is we have, and I say we, my wife and I, okay. we have whiskey balls. <laughs> I'll bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it a does. medical condition. <laughs> So tell me about your whiskey balls, Carl. <laughs> now we're going to have to rate the show PG. I'm sorry. Um, these are essentially silicon molds that are about oh, two yeah. or three inches. I've got some of those that, that I use for uh, I use for ice. Yeah, yeah. And you fill them with water and you put them in there. And the the idea behind the whiskey ball is that it's an ice cube, but it's round and it has less surface area than a whole bunch of little ice cubes, so it melts slower. Yeah, the minimal surface area for its volume, right? Yep. So it melts slower. Very clever. Yeah. But I'm perfectly fine filling my glass with ice and pouring bourbon yeah. over it and just letting it dilute because I like that. I really do. I bought one of those whiskey ball molds to make lint chocolates. I wanted to make oh, lint balls. So I'm going nice. to use that to, to shape Richard's the form. Richard's got chocolate balls. Massive. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you must try my chocolate balls. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. So that, that's an awesome, awesome. I'm going to have to try a Manhattan. I've yeah. never, I don't think I've ever had one, so oh, okay. it'll be an experience. Yeah, yeah. It's you'll get the flavor of the Manhattan without the the sugar of sweet vermouth. So that's my mm. recipe, and I think that's a show. I think I just want to add one thing that uh, drink re drink responsibly, everybody. Uh, we're we're uh, we're not encouraging you to to go out and drink a lot of alcohol as part of your diet, right? Uh, but you certainly can have some al alcohol, and I think it's important to. We want this really to be a way of life, not a diet. So we don't right. want it to be. You don't want to be so strict. That's right. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to. You, you've got to live this for the rest of your life. And so, at least I intend to. Um, yep, so and, do I. Yeah, that's awesome. So I think that it's important to have some pleasures. And yeah, by today I had a few too many drinks and I had a few too many carbs, and I'm regretting it. And I'm going to go for a bike ride. In penance afterwards, but uh, everything in moderation, uh, kids, including moderation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Okay, see you. Bye bye.